Amen. Well, I want to welcome you if you're uh, here for the first time as a guest today. God bless you. Welcome to you. Um, if you've not already figured it out or discerned it, um, we're just a bunch of people that love Jesus because he's loved us. And uh, far from perfect, but we're in hot pursuit of a loving God. Amen? He's pursued us, and now he's put something in us that makes us long to know him, and that's why we're here, and we uh, do everything we know to do to try to press through all the religious traps and all the sidebar issues and stay focused on the person of Jesus Christ. It's really about the person of Jesus Christ. It's about knowing Him. It's about experiencing Him. And in that kind of interaction with God, real change takes place. I can look back on my life, and the only places that I've really been changed is when I encountered the person of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're about. It's what we're pushing for. Um, you know, as a church, we unashamedly... You could call us charismatic, which, you know, people have different definitions, but what that really says is that we believe that the Bible is true and is for today. And the scripture is plain that the church received a gift from heaven. When Jesus ascended back to the Father, very plain, Acts chapter 2, he gave the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit to his church to empower the church to accomplish the mandate of going into all the world and making disciples of all nations. That's the bottom line. It's real simple. And we believe that that power, if it was necessary back then, how much more is that same power necessary today at a time when the Bible says the end of the age is going to be more complicated and stress-filled than the beginning? I'm not, you know, being doom and gloom. I'm just telling you, before the Lord comes, it's going to get a little crazy. That's what the Bible teaches. And so I don't know about you, but I don't want to be powerless. I don't want to be lacking any of the gifts that God saw fit to give us in that hour. I mean, if he's given me a gift of wisdom, how about having hold of that one in the hour when everything's going crazy? We believe the Bible is for today, that the gifts of the Spirit are for today, and they're to be exercised uh, in godly order. There is a certain order that goes with uh, prescribed uh, guidelines, if you will. The Apostle Paul does a real great job in his letters to the Corinthians and elsewhere about the gifts of the Spirit, but we're not ashamed of them. Amen? And uh, so why am I saying all of that? I have no idea. I just feel like it's important to put us in remembrance. And if you're a guest and maybe you're wondering what's going on in this place, um, you know, that'll help you at least have a certain starting point and you can get your Bible and do a little research. And if you've got questions, be happy to spend some time talking with you. Um, we believe if it's in the Scripture, it's appropriate and right for us and we should go after it. Amen. So we've been in a series of teachings uh, on the pace of grace. And uh, today would actually be the fifth session that we've had. Uh, if you were to try to count them, five is the number of grace. So this is, that means it's going to be a great sermon today. Somebody say amen and help me out here. Talk to me. Help me along. Come on. Fan the flame with me. The pace of grace. A lot's been said, and I'm not going to take the time this morning to recap. If you are here as a guest uh, feel free to go out onto the internet. There's, those are all out there on the church's uh, website, as well as we have an app you can get on your phone. You can listen to messages there and so on. I would encourage you to do so. I don't know how it's been for you, but for me personally, you know, if, if the preacher's not getting anything from it, chances are you're not going to get anything from it. And I just have to tell you, I've been getting a ton out of God's work in this area in my life about the pace of grace. And, uh, you know, the comical thing most of you have chuckled with me and identified, I think, with me when I talked to you about how one day the Lord told me, uh, he questioned me as to why I was going a few miles an hour over the speed limit, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about because you've been terribly convicted throughout the course of this series, I know. <clears throat> but I wasn't like, like, 
really breaking the law, just a few miles an hour over the speed limit. I was talking about this a couple weeks ago, and I looked out there, and I realized well, I have a police officer in the congregation. He's probably going to lock me up after the service, my public confession, you know, I don't know. But anyway, um, so yeah, the Lord just spoke to me. He says, what are you in such a hurry? I was on my way to prayer early in the morning, and what are you in such a hurry for? Well, he exposed in me this something in me that was racing through life. You know, the spirit in which I was doing my life was an anxious spirit, kind of like, it's on me to get it done, it's on me to get it done. And we saw the scripture in Isaiah that says, I lay in Zion a stone, right? A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, talking about Jesus. And whoever believes on him will not make haste. And so the Lord just began to deal with me about this hasty spirit I was in. You know, you can go to prayer in a hasty spirit, but what kind of prayers are those going to be? anxious prayers, you know, prayers that are kind of going anywhere. So, so I've been, somebody asked me the other day, are you still going the speed limit? I mean, we're, we're a month in now. And I'm here to report, by the grace of God, I'm still doing the speed limit. I haven't been released from doing the speed limit. And um, the other day I was driving down the road and suddenly my phone, you know, you're not supposed to text and drive. But a text message came through, bing! And in my car, you can touch the screen on the front of the car, and it'll read it to you. So I just touched the screen, and it was dear sister Drew. She apparently had just passed me on the road, and she just said, I'm so glad I'm not behind you. <laughs> you know, part of the deal, part of the challenge from the Lord for me has been as I'm driving the the speed limit, and God's using this to expose this part of me that's just anxiously going through life. Got to get there in a hurry. Part of the struggle has been as cars stack up behind me and the pressure's on. I hate that. I'm such a man pleaser and I didn't even realize it. It's just, I hate it. I hate that I hate that I hate it. So <clears throat> I've got some really good news if you've been struggling like I've been struggling in this area maybe. Um, that the pace of grace is not necessarily a speed, fast or slow. Pace of grace isn't about a speed, though for me I've been illustrating and exposing, God's been exposing this other pace, this kind of frantic pace that I've been in, caught up in, but it's not about 35 miles an hour or 45 or 50 miles an hour. It's not about speed in that sense. It's about source. The pace of grace is about the source of your movement. What's, what is it that's propelling you? How fast you're going is an issue if you're outside of the grace of God, if that's making any sense. It's not about how fast you're going. It's about are you in the grace of God as you're going. It's about the source of your movement. What's fueling your movement? Is it human effort that's going to get the job done, all your strivings? Or are you being moved along by the grace and the anointing of God through life? And this is the thing I think God's calling us to figure out. He wants us to begin to understand what this pace of grace is about. Because sometimes the pace of grace might be the speed of light. Physically, it could be really fast, really amazing stuff can happen. Boom, 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 boom. But, uh, but it's not about speed in that sense. It's about source of what's getting it done. Is it grace making it happen? God's spirit energizing it? Or is it human effort? Not always easy to discern where that line starts and stops. But I'm convinced of this. The pace of grace is found by stewarding, hear me, his presence. You see, the idea of pace of grace to me says this, not getting ahead of God, not being behind what God is wanting me to be doing. The pace of grace is directly related to the presence of God in your life. Are you moving in sync with God's movement and God's plan for your life? If you're outside of that, whether you're running ahead or whether you're lagging behind, you are outside of the pace of grace. Because the pace of grace is found in His presence. You see, if you're going to get practical here, 
How do I know if I'm moving at the right speed? Well, ask yourself, am I enjoying the presence of the Lord? You know, you've heard the story and heard sermons, I'm sure, about it, but Jesus, at the age of 12, his family went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. Remember, at the age of 12, there was a whole caravan of worshipers that went to Jerusalem, celebrated the Passover. Passover feast was over. They were all returning home, but Jesus remained in the city, and no one knew he wasn't in the caravan. A couple days down the road, mom starts asking questions. Has anybody seen Jesus? Now, I can tell you, they went to the feast. I can tell you they left at the appropriate time of the feast. They were on their way home. None of that was out of norm. And they were probably going the speed limit. But it didn't matter. Because if Jesus wasn't with them, they were no longer moving at the pace of grace. You see, you might think, and I might think, we're actually making progress and we're going forward. But if Jesus isn't a part of it, you're not going forward. You see, forward movement, real forward movement, is related to the presence of God in your life. So this pace thing, it's about the source of your movements. And I think, practically speaking, we can center around the person of Jesus and kind of put the dipstick in and ask yourself, am I enjoying fellowship with God in what I'm doing and where I'm going and how I'm going? Those are indicators of being in that pace of grace. Not ahead, not behind, with Him is what it's about. Doing life with Him. Hebrews chapter 6, you know the Scripture. We don't have it here up on the screen or anything yet, but Hebrews 6, talking about the foundational doctrines, right? Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews says, let us go on to perfection, not laying again, the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And then he says this, and this we will do, we'll go on to perfection, this we will do if God permits. You see, we can't go on unless God permits. You see, God his presence, his approval is what sets the pace of forward movement. It's what sets the pace of grace. And so if you're going to busy yourself with anything, you're going to occupy your thinking and your time with anything, occupy it with the presence of Jesus. Jesus, today, am I, are we in good fellowship? Are we communing together? Are we moving? Am I moving with you? Because if I am, I can be assured that in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. Grace upon grace is available for me as I walk with you in my life. And let me tell you, sometimes walking with God, it'll make, you know, others won't be in the same sink with you. It's like me on the road going 35 and people stacking up behind me. You got to choose, don't you? (laughs) I'm either going to stay at the speed limit of grace that God for me has set. Now, by the way, I'm not mandating on this on any of you, but I could give you scriptures that would. (laughs) But I'm not. Thank you. (laughs) I heard Tom say thank you, yeah. But you know, I can make a choice in that moment when all the pressure's on to move faster. Go faster, because people are stacking up behind you as you go the speed limit. By the way, we got some bumper stickers coming, if you dare. The Pace of Grace bumper stickers. Oh gosh, we're going to start a movement, or a lack thereof. <laughs> uh, you got to choose. Am I going to live to the people, or live to God? Live to the people, or live to God? What pace are you going to go and why? What's the source? What's causing the speed of your movement? The opinions of people or wanting to be pleasing to the Lord? Please don't take this message uh, and these series of messages again as some kind of yoke on your life. This is God's effort to deliver us from human vain initiatives and to move us into something so surpassing. You see, Our current way of operating isn't going to get the job done. 
We've got to tap a source so much greater than our own. And as long as we're in our own anxious style of life, we're never going to enjoy and resource all that heaven's made available. I don't know if you're hearing me. God's trying to help us not hurt us. And when I'm in my car going 35 and the cars are stacking up, it hurts. But you know what part hurts? It's my pride. It's my need to make everybody happy. Oh, God, deliver me so that I'll be. You know, Paul said this in the book of Acts. God, here's Paul's words. God delivered me from the people to whom he sent me. You've got to be delivered from the people God sends you to. Because if you're not delivered from them, you'll never be a faithful witness to them. We need to be delivered from this man-pleasing thing. And let me tell you, it doesn't come easy. Not for me anyways. It might for you, but gosh, I mean, I have been, I've been wrestling through with Jesus. But I tell you, the more and the more I move down this path with Him, I find grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient for me. Now, as I acknowledged already, for me, it's taken physically slowing down to expose this anxious thing in me. It's the way God chose to pull it up on the surface. I don't know what he'll do to pull it up to your surface for you to see where you're in your own flesh and your own strength. But for me, this is how it's happened. Um, to recognize my human strivings. This does not mean now that we have license to break the speed limit. Once you realize it's not about speed, it's about source. It doesn't mean, okay, <laughs> praise God, if I feel Jesus going 85 and a 35, it's okay. I'm feeling it. You know? I remember one time hearing a guy that was a uh, young, young husband, wife was pregnant, first child, and trying to figure out what it was going to be like when she started to go into labor. So in his mind, he had... True story. In his mind, he had determined that on that day, driving to the hospital, it was legal to speed. I mean, it's just the way it is, right? If your wife's in labor, you've got license to speed. And if the cop pulls you over, you simply point to the woman screaming. Right? Come on, honey, scream, scream. That's what you're supposed to tell him, right? But, you know, that's kind of what, that's what his thinking was. So the day came. She went in labor. He was so geared up for this event. I mean, you know, it ended up being about a 13-hour labor, okay? <clears throat> he was so ramped up and amped up for this event that he's going down the road in this big old Ford pickup truck. Oh! You know, on the interstate, going way over the speed limit. And the wife <laughs> looked at him and said, I think we can slow down. It's going to be okay. You know, it's like, it's like I'm going to be fine. I'm, I'm just, I, I know that I'm having a baby, but it's, it's okay. Chill out. You know, it's like he was so, he, he felt like he had permission to go over the speed limit simply because it was the time. I am, I want to make sure I'm clear here. I'm not granting permission to go over the speed limit. Okay? Just because in our minds, we've, made it justified. You've heard the story, I'm sure, but of the priest who's in his, uh, in his car and uh, he's kind of swerving down the road a little bit. Law officer pulls him over. Says, uh, <clears throat> he's got his collar on and everything, you know. Can I see your license? Oh, yeah. Gives him his license. Smells alcohol. He says, uh, what's in the cup? He said, oh, oh, this? He said, yeah. The officer says, can I see that, please? He says, oh, sure. He gives him the cup. Officer says, smells like wine. And he says, praise the Lord, he did it again. <laughs> Actually, I screwed it up because he told him it was just water. And that was part of the joke. It was just water. And then he smelled it. He says, smells like wine. He says, praise the Lord. He did it again. When it's God's grace that's propelling your movements and your activities, 
He'll defend you against every lesser law of the land when it's God's grace doing it. You know, the apostles broke the social speed limits many times, and they were at the pace of grace. They were actually doing the will of God, and they were stirring up all kinds of stuff. I don't want us to leave these series of teachings with the idea that the pace of grace is just about apathetic, slow, kind of... No, no. God's positioning a people to make real movements and real change in society. It's going to shake up and get a lot of stuff moving when people, you and me, let's talk real personally here, when we start recognizing this pace, this grace that's been given and start cooperating with it, stuff is going to happen. I was thinking about the physical pace, the speed of grace that people experience in the Scripture. One clear example of this would be Brother Elijah, right? First Kings chapter 18. Let me read to you about Brother Elijah. You know, he's been used mightily of God to bring a great revival, repentance to a nation, Israel, who's been worshiping all kinds of pagan gods and such. And in First Kings chapter 18, um, <clears throat> you know, they've had no rain. He prophesied there would be no rain. They've been in a drought and they've had a, a great showdown with the prophets of Baal and fires come down from heaven and whatever. And then here we are, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 45, and it says, in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. Now remember, there's been a drought for three and a half years, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Now Ahab was the king, and Ahab was in a chariot, and Elijah had just told him, get in your chariot because it's about to rain. Now they've had drought for three and a half years. So he's been praying, he's been seeking the Lord, and he says, go, do this. So the clouds start filling up with rain, verse 46, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel, meaning Elijah physically outran a chariot being pulled by a horse. Why? Because the hand of the Lord was on him. Grace. You talk about the pace of grace, how fast fast you'll be able to get things done. Here's the thing. You might have to go slow for a season to expose your human effort. But once we figure out where our human efforts start and stop and we learn how to stay in God's grace, the speed at which you move and get things done may and will, I believe, be exponential. I mean, things are going to start happening like this. Boom, 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 boom. In the natural suddenlies are going to begin occurring. Why? Because he was under the hand. That's a significant reference in the Scripture. That over and over, if you've studied, I know there's a group of you who've been studying the foundational doctrines, the doctrine of laying on of hands. Can God handle you? If God can put his hand on you, Elijah was under the hand of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. God, resist the proud. Come on, help me somebody. He gives what? Grace to the humble. Under the hand is the doorway to the grace of God. You see, under the speed limit, for me, has been under the hand. It's like, God, oh. God says, hang in there with me, son. Hang in there with me. Because the day's coming when I'm going to let you go 95. And that's just, you know what I'm talking. If you ever see me come zinging by you, instead of being behind me. You know, it's like the ambulance, when they come by, everybody wants to get behind them. Whoo! Get to move fast, right? Through traffic, right? The hand of the Lord was on him, and he beat. The physical limitations were overcome because he was in a place of grace, the pace of grace under the hand of the Lord. Notice if you take the time to read the context of this passage that Elijah had been in a season of prayer. He had been in like a fetal position, like a woman giving birth to a child actually. And he'd been crying out to God. And uh, his servant went up seven times and finally saw the cloud in the shape of a size of a man's hand. The point there is this, is that if you've been in these series of messages, you know we talked about waiting on the Lord, right? Those who wait on the Lord, wait for the Lord. 
are spending the time to be entangled with God and tied together with God. Those people, right? That's the context of this event. And out of that place, the hand of the Lord came on him. And great grace propelled him to outrun a chariot. I couldn't help but think about a New Testament example very similar. Philip. You remember Philip, the evangelist, right? What happens to Philip the evangelist? Starts off as a deacon. Signs and wonders begin to happen through the deacon. Stephen's doing miracles and so on. And Philip got this grace for evangelism. And during a time of persecution, goes out. He's in a city, Samaria, preaches Christ. The whole city comes to faith. Signs and wonders. Devils are screaming out of people, the Bible says. Miracles are happening. He stepped into an amazing flow of grace. And right in the middle of it, the, the Lord speaks to him and says, Philip, I want you to leave this revival and I want you to go out into the wilderness. That was it. He just had a word. I'm supposed to leave. Now listen, talk about pressure to stay. The pressure was there to stay. He, he's been the, the evangelist. A whole, it says, the scripture says, great joy was in that city. A whole city has come alive in the gospel because of the grace he's been flowing in. And suddenly he gets this word that says, Philip, pace of grace is now going somewhere else. Will you stay in sync even if it hurts your public reputation or it doesn't let you drink from all the notoriety? Will you go out into a wilderness place? Philip, thankfully, we understand, has learned this principle of the pace of grace, which is related, come on, help me today, to the presence of Jesus. Not behind him, not before him, with him. So when the Spirit says go, we need to develop the attitude that says, yes, sir, I don't want to be anywhere else but where you are. So to me, that's a demonstration like Elijah that Philip was under the hand of the Lord, meaning he could be handled. God could say, don't go or do go, and he would do it. And the question that resounds for all of us today is, can God handle you? And how do you act when he tries to handle you? It's an important question. Philip was clearly under the hand. He obeyed. He went. And look what happened to him. Acts chapter 8. Let me just read to you the account. Acts chapter 8, 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise, go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasures. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Much like Elijah was, I'm sorry, Ahab you know, was in a chariot, and Elijah ran to meet him. Here, Philip, in the New Testament, is having a similar encounter of grace. And the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah. Now, it's a little vague here, but I like to think of this story in the way that, you know, this guy is being pulled in a chariot, right? He's moving. Philip sees him, and the Spirit says, go catch him. Go join yourself to him. So Philip, we hear right here, he has to run. So he's running. But I think he's running at what speed? Come on. What speed is Philip running at? Yeah. Now he came under the hand of God, which said, obedience, follow me. You know, sometimes grace isn't immediate on your life. Oh, no, listen to me. Sometimes God just says, go do something. And we think, I will once I get the goosebump. And God says, no, no, this isn't about the goose bump. This is about do. Say it with me. Do. Do what I've asked you to do. And so he just went to the wilderness. And as he got there, right, then he got his next part of the assignment. There he is. Go join yourself. And he ran, I'm convinced, at the pace of grace. And really, realistically speaking, it had to do with the speed of that chariot that day. I mean, wherever the distance was and the speed of that chariot was God's determined pace for him because, hear this now, the pace of grace is related to the purpose of grace. Just let that soak for a second. 
The pace of grace is related to the purpose of grace. So if the purpose was to get Philip to the chariot, then that determines how much grace is necessary to get the job done. Sometimes we think the pace of grace is just to make us look good and make us do all. It's, it's related to a purpose in the heart of God. Stay aligned with the purpose and you'll stay aligned with the grace. Fall out of alignment with the purpose and you'll find yourself burnt out. You know what? Some of you are burnt out. You're worn out because somewhere along the way, and I'm not pointing a finger at you, I'm talking about us. You got out of a line with the pace of grace. You see, in that place, there is health, strength, and ability to do what God has assigned you to do. Outside of that place, <laughs> you're going to frustrate yourself and frustrate people around you. Ask my wife. So, Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. <laughs> I'm thinking Philip must have said to him as he was running beside him, do you know what you're reading? Uh, you might see him. I, I see him running while they're talking. That's how I see it. He's running. He hears him reading. Hey, what you're reading? Do you know what it is? And the guy says, well, how can I unless someone tells me? And I think it doesn't say it in the Scripture, but I think Philip said, well, if you'll stop the thing, I'd be happy to tell you. <laughs> you know, Because the pace of grace wasn't necessarily to keep, it was to get to the purpose of grace, right? Which was to bring the gospel to this, not only this man, but to another nation through this man. Think of how Philip went and preached to a whole city. They got saved. And now he's preaching to an individual who's going to go impact an entire nation. It's amazing. The pace of grace causes us to catch people where they are. So, Philip brings the gospel to him. The guy believes in his heart. Verse 36, Acts 8, verse 36. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You know, I, I, just give me a little liberty here, but I think of things like this for some reason when I'm reading the Scripture. Here Philip is moving further and further. They're, on, they're driving toward Ethiopia, you know? And uh, they're getting further and further away from Philip's home. You know, Philip had two daughters, we know that, that were prophets. And uh, he's getting further and further away from home, and here he is, they're, they're going along. It's clear to me that this grace empowers us to do things that are difficult, naturally speaking. You read the stories of people who've left everything to obey the call. Today, that's not a popular message. Today, the modern Christian message is, oh, just come to Jesus and He'll give you everything. He'll give you everything, and it's true. He does bless us. He loves us. It's an overwhelming thing He does for us. But the message that says, give it all away, has been lost. And the reason that we don't have much of the grace we know we're supposed to have is because we've not been willing to stay at the pace or in the presence and in the will of the one who's giving the grace. You see, this grace is found in relationship and in obedience. And it's a joyful obedience, by the way. It really is. Let me, let me just let me help clarify that. Obedience, to me, is, is better than sacrifice. Now, you might interpret that to mean God is really, you know, but obedience is better in the sense that when you obey, life is better. <laughs> Did you just hear what I said? Some of you are looking at me like, what? Yeah. When you obey, life is better. Well, but I want to do my own thing. Okay, 
Go do your own thing. And I'll see you in a little while. And tell me how that went. Come on, the scripture says, the way of the transgressor is hard. That's what the Bible says. The way of the one who does his own thing, that way is hard. It's tough. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. You see, obedience or staying connected and staying in sync with him and not getting ahead, not being behind, being in the flow with him in real time is actually a better, obedience is better than sacrifice. It's a better way of living. It's a beautiful way of living. There's joy there once we get over our own stuff. Now, you either believe that or prove that, but that is the way it is. You know, I, I, I find that in every place it's taken me so long, I have made so many mistakes. I have gone my own way more than anyone could count. God in His mercies has allowed me to circle back around, to repent, thank God for repentance. He's allowed me in His mercies to come back to center again and to get on the path again and to start walking. And over and over and over again, He's allowed me to try both ways. I've done my thing and I've done His thing. And I have to say, by far, when I'm in His will, life is good. When I'm not, it's not. It just isn't. It's just miserable. There's always something eating at you and tearing at you and being in Him and with Him is what it's all about. And I, I don't get any points for saying that to you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. That's the reality of it all. So Philip, as he's moving further and further away from his own family and time with his family, he's gone out of a big city revival. God only knows some of the personal issues maybe he was having to deal with. Some of you maybe are wrestling with some personal things. Like, you know, God, I want to follow, but, or you've got other things you're struggling and wrestling with. Let me just tell you, if you know God is speaking to you about certain things, don't overcomplicate this. Stay synchronized with Him, and He's going to give you what it takes to not only finish your assignment that you're currently working on in God, but he's going to give you a multiplication. I've shared this story a, a time or two maybe before over the years, but it's the story of the brother we got to hear about when we were in Cuba. He was a pastor. Cuba was a very difficult, difficult place to be as a believer. <clears throat> and um, just making daily provisions was an issue, right? And... Uh, Anyways, God told him he wanted him to go to this place called the Isle of Pines, right? Isle of Pines, I think it was. Just, it's a part of Cuba, but it's just detached, and it's a little bit below Cuba. And uh, it was basically a prison, a penal island, where they would bring notorious prisoners and stuff and put them all on this island. And that's where it was. And it was, it, nobody wanted to live there, okay, is the point. Nobody wanted to be there. It was bad enough being in Cuba, but now i got to go to the Isle of Pines. And the Lord, he kept wrestling with God. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And, and finally, finally, after a lot of wrestling back and forth, he went to this place and he figured he would just kind of plow through whatever it was there and he was supposed to try to start a church or something. And while he was there, little did he know that Castro had recruited, he was trying to promote his version of communism to the world. And the way he was going to do this was he got the smartest and the brightest African minds he could find, very bright, bright Africans, he brought them from Africa to Cuba to indoctrinate them in his version of communism and then to send them back to Africa, right, to spread that way of, of life and belief, right? So here's this pastor, he's all frustrated, he's been wrestling with God about obedience and whatever, he finally submits, finds himself on this God-forsaken, seemingly God-forsaken island, and uh, suddenly he finds himself meeting all these young adults, African, brilliant, young African minds that are there to go to school. Castro's footing the bill for them being there. He begins to win them to Christ, one by one, he begins converting them to the Lord. 
He has a whole house movement that begins with young, smart, brilliant African minds. Castro's feeding them and paying the bill while they're being discipled by this guy. And then they get sent back to Africa as missionaries. Now, come on, talk to me, right? You talk about the grace of God available. What do you, how do you think that pastor felt after he finally stepped in and woke up to what God was doing? What went from a, a season of real discouragement and self-pity and went into a season of, oh God, you've chosen me. You see, sometimes we get so frustrated by what's not working or seemingly not working. And we miss the fact that God is positioning us. I know I've said it before, but sometimes God creates problems to fix problems. Read the story of Hannah. The Bible says God closed her womb. And why did God close her womb? That was a problem, by the way. I know you've heard this, but some of you haven't, so just hang with me. Why did God close her womb? Because a whole nation had gone astray. And God was looking to raise up a prophet. And Hannah was just a woman who wanted to have babies. And in that day, you could have multiple wives, and she was a part of, uh, 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 there was another woman who was married to the same husband. And uh, she was having all kinds of babies, and it was a torment to her, and life was bad. And Hannah kept saying, oh God, I just want a baby. My life sucks. I had to wake somebody up. I don't know why I said it. I just <laughs> get somebody thinking. Yeah, it just, it's all, it's such a bummer. I can, you know, whatever. And she got so desperate. Finally, she changed her prayer and she said, oh God, all right, here's the deal. If you'll give me a child, here's the deal. I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. And as soon as God heard that prayer, which how did she get to that point? frustration, desperation, things not working. God created a problem, her womb. God, not the devil. God, read the Bible. God closed her womb. God created a temporal little problem in order to fix a big problem, which was a whole nation that was gone astray. And he needed somebody to get aligned with his will. So up to that point, Hannah was doing what? Hannah was thinking about her own little world. God, I just want to be a happy wife. Just make my little world happy. I want to go to work. I want to come home with a decent paycheck. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to. Right? Come on. Little lens, little world, looking at this little stuff, and God's saying, oh, i got to get somebody thinking outside of their little world just for a few moments. If I could just have somebody to think with me on what I'm doing in the earth and to be available for what I'm doing in the earth. If I could just find people like that. And as soon as Hannah got so desperate, she said, God, I'll give him back to you. The Bible says God opened her womb. And in her womb was formed Samuel, the prophet. And the scripture says of Samuel, you know it, that not one of his words fell to the ground. That's a pretty powerful statement about somebody. That when he spoke, it came to pass. Right? That's awesome. And it all came out of a woman who was barren and having a lot of issues until she stepped over outside of her needs into God's needs or God's plan. Grace, grace, grace. And by the way, after that, what happened to her? She had a bunch of her own children. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. All right, let me continue. Acts 8, 39. This is back to, back to uh, Philip. We're, we're getting there. Just hang with me. And when they were come up out of the water, he baptizes the guy. He, I love this. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Huh, wow. That the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Philip, literally, you talk about the pace of grace not being slow. Remember what we're talking about here. This idea of the pace of grace doesn't mean moving slow like me doing the speed limit. That just exposes my, my source for getting my stuff done. But when you're in the pace of grace, that is light speed right there. 
He went from one place by the Spirit. I know it's like way beyond what we can comprehend, but this is what the Bible says. Philip was caught up by the Spirit and moved to a whole other city without having to run, without having to take a chariot, without having to do anything. He was by the Spirit translated to another location. Boom. And when he hit the ground, you got to know he was a happy guy. When he hit the ground, he started preaching again. Talk about getting an increase from God. An increase from the Lord. It's amazing. Interesting point. I know you guys just listen. Hear it, please. This grace is not about making us look good. This grace is about making Jesus look good. You know, if you want to get promoted, make your boss look good. Selah. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Now here it is, that the eunuch saw him, Philip, no more. You see, this grace, the grace God's wanting to give us in a new fashion, a new way, it won't be that people are going to look at us when they've experienced us. Matter of fact, they're going to get to the place where they're going to see us no more. Philip was caught away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and here's what it says, and he went on his way rejoicing, meaning that when this grace is doing what God intended it to do, people are going to be attracted to Jesus and not you. The emphasis will be about Jesus and not you. And by the way, you'll be happy in that place because you know that that's where the grace flows from. That's how this grace is given. It's why this grace is given. It's not given to promote you. It's, hear me, it's not given to promote your ministry. Although your ministry will be promoted when you're under this grace. It's given to promote Jesus. I find a lot of times we're asking for more grace because we want people to be impressed with us. God's giving grace to people who are not impressed with themselves. Don't be impressed with yourself. You set yourself up for things to bring you back into reality. I mean, you know what I mean when I say don't be impressed with yourself. Be impressed with Jesus. Philip was caught up. It's a fascinating principle, a fascinating word. It means this in the Greek language, to seize, to catch away, to catch up, to pluck, to pull, to take by force. It's all pretty powerful stuff. Philip, suddenly, I don't think he was expecting that. I, I think he just came up out of the water. Assignment was done. And because he had been obedient and faithful and was living in the grace that God had given him, suddenly God snatched him up and took him away. But notice this, it comes from a root word that means to take for one's self. That is, to prefer. So Philip being caught up is as if to say God took him for himself because he had preferred him. It was as if God was saying, I want to make an example. That's why I think the story is included in the scripture. Out of what it looks like to tap into this grace. We see it in Enoch. Enoch walked with God. But before, you know, but he, and, he, and God took him, the Bible says. He was caught up to God. But before God took him, he had a testimony that he pleased God. Right? By faith. He pleased him. To take for himself. This, I know, you know, I, I don't know why. I shouldn't apologize. Amen. You know, sometimes when I stand up here, I've, I've had my head in the Word, in prayer, and in the presence of God. I've been just spending time with the Lord. And so as I'm doing that, I get all kinds of information. Some of it's pertinent, some of it's not. And I just have a tendency to put a lot out there. I do. I get it. Right? So this whole message is about grace, so grace for grace. I give you some grace, you give me some grace. Right? 
I never know what pieces may belong to what people. You see, there may be only one thing in this whole message today that is for you. Just one. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. If it was God's one thing for you and you missed it because you were having to wade through all the other stuff I was saying, you missed it. And you'll suffer because you missed it. If God was the one sending it. You know, that's the bottom line. If it was God sending it. I find these things fascinating. When I think about grace that can be grown, I believe in grace that can be grown. I believe grace is a stewardship issue. I think Philip started off as a deacon. That's what the Bible says. We know that as out of just serving and just doing what God made available to him, just in, in, in the nowhere places, not up front with the big hot shots, you know, the apostles. He was just a, in the behind-the-scenes guy serving tables, and in that place of service, God saw something in him and said, hey, you've learned to walk with me. Not worried about men's opinions. You're walking with me. That's the pace of grace, and I'm going to promote you. And suddenly, Philip at a time of great persecution and trouble, steps into another level of grace. We now know him as Philip, not the deacon. We now know him as Philip the evangelist. He's gone from deacon grace to evangelist grace, winning a whole city. Miracles are happening. Think about it. A whole city has come out to hear the gospel. And in those meetings, people are screaming with devils coming out. It's pretty powerful stuff. And then we see Philip going from that grace out into the wilderness, preaching to one man, and he steps into a whole other grace. I like to call it the Philip Express. Up out of the water, in another city. I'm thinking, oh God, that would be so cool. I mean, think about that. You know? I think Philip had a shirt, t-shirt that said, The Pace of Grace. And he preached in it. That's my opinion. But he was caught up as one who's preferred or caught up to one's self. It's not just the ride from one city to another. It's the person doing the catching up that's the issue here. God is looking down and saying, oh, I love what I see going on in that guy's heart. I can use that man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour more grace on him Check this out, Philip. Shoom. Bang. You see, you can steward this grace. God gives increase. It's the same word, by the way, to catch up. Paul says, I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, he was caught up to paradise. Same Greek word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 7 says this. We're going to be caught up together to be with the Lord in the clouds. Caught up, rapture, people would call that in some circles. Whatever, however you list that. It's the same Greek word to catch up here. Spiritually something happened. Revelation 12, 5 is the same Greek word. I saw a man child and, and the dragon came against him and he was caught up to God. Same Greek word to catch up for one's self. By God, for God. Caught away, not to escape, caught away to be used again like Philip was caught away and dropped into another city. We're talking about our people who are being caught into a realm. Listen, we have settled for so little. Don't settle for where you are right now. God's pulling some people, if you're one of them, I believe you are, into a new realm. If you can hear these words today, listen to them. He's exposing our human efforts in order to get us outside of the limits of our human efforts. Not to penalize us, to help us, so that outside of our human efforts we can move into a whole other realm where the source of our movement or the pace of our movement is determined by the grace we're walking in. The day will come if we'll steward this grace well, that what's taken us years to seemingly accomplish in our own strength will happen in seconds and in moments. Are you hearing these words today? 
I don't know if you believe them or not, but I'm, I'm going to sow them anyways. I believe this. It's God's desire. The pace of grace, it doesn't mean physically slow in getting things done. It means the source of what gets done is not us, but God. And we've simply obeyed and stayed in relationship along the way. So I'm feeling the grace lifting. I do want to remind us of just two thoughts that have been spoken in previous messages. And it has to do with double grace. By the way, if you've never noticed this, you know, so the number five, right, in the Bible is often referred to as the number of grace. Many associations with the number five and the theme of grace. And we've been talking about double grace. Zechariah says, grace, grace will be shouted unto the temple when it's being built. That's how it's going to get finished. And, you know, John talks about grace upon grace, right? Grace for grace. Right outside the door, if you've never noticed this because you don't drive the speed limit, it's 55. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that. I think it's significant. That when you drive in front of Living Waters, there's a sign that says, Grace, Grace. Five, five. Now, if you're going 57, I just want you to know, there is no grace. There's grace and perfection. <laughs> I could hear that before you said that, brother. I could hear that before you said that. Tell the officer that. <laughs> yeah. I was going 58 because the number five is grace and the number eight is new beginnings. That's the beginning of your next payment for this ticket, yeah. I just want to put us in remembrance of these simple things here. That is that double grace, right? Double grace. John 1, 16. Here's what John says. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Or some translations say grace for grace. Or double grace. We made the reference to Zechariah about grace, grace being shouted, learning how to stay in those graces. And we said this, real simple, but there's a common grace given to everybody. The grace of God which brings salvation, it's a grace that gives to everybody. But then there's another grace, and that grace has to be found, and it has to be stewarded. So you can be saved by common grace. Going to heaven, we're not talking about earning something here, none of that common grace given to everybody. But the second grace, grace upon grace, this other grace is a grace that's to be found. Let me give you this verse. We're just repeating, but hear it again. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Here's what it says. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that's an invitation, that we may obtain mercy, and here it says it, and find grace to help in time of need. All right, so we have an invitation from God. This is not common grace. This is unique grace to boldly come knowing that you've been invited. You don't have to, you know, uh, apologize and justify why you're coming and I've been, I've, I've been a good guy today. Give me some more grace. No, no, this is an invitation. Let us boldly come based on common grace which makes us clean before God. Common grace, make, boldly come to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. Now let me tell you, it is a time of need. You may have personal needs that you need to find grace for, but if you've already got, I'm telling you, the world is full of need, right? So here's our invitation. God's saying, I'm looking for a double grace people. I'm looking for people who've received common grace, but they've also understood the stewardship of this other grace. And I'm asking, I'm inviting, will you come and find grace to help? 
I think it's pointing to your unique gift and your unique calling that God put in you from the foundation of the world. And the question is, are you going to operate in it? Are you going to find it and operate in it? I was thinking of Pastor Eric the other day. We were trying to get some numbers together for the upper school build out. And initially at first glance, after the architect drew their stuff up and we hired a gal to kind of go through and see what it's going to take to convert that building. And it was going to be $150,000, $175,000 to do some renovations. We're like, ah! And basically Eric said, let me see those drawings. Work through, went to the... Got it down to around a 50 mark, 50,000 mark. Grace, why are you wired the way you're wired? And are you, how, are, how well are you stewarding that grace? Because like Philip, Deacon Philip, what are we doing with the grace we've received? So I think this invitation for all of us, if we're going to move at the pace of grace, Right? The pace of grace is related to the presence of Jesus. Not behind, not before. And it has to do with the source of our activities. Is he the author? And are we willing to boldly approach him? So let's stand up today. I want to pray for us as a congregation. In my own heart, I'm just... Uh, I feel like God has commissioned me. That's how I feel to ready a people for a great move of the Spirit of God. I feel like I've been charged by the Lord to help all of us, myself included. I'm having to wrestle, as I've said. But he's, he's getting us ready to move outside of natural ability into this realm with no limits. And we've got to be willing for him to expose ourselves anxious lifestyles. Are you willing for him to expose that stuff? Not so he can take from you, but so he can give to you and to me. Father, I know you're staring right now, joyfully staring at each one of us in this place. And I want to say thank you today for the grace you've extended for us to be born again. Lord, we're here today, most of us in this room today, simply because your grace has found us. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. How sweet that sound is to us. I'm wondering today, maybe you're even here today, and in your own heart right now, if today was your last day on earth, and you were going to step over into eternity, you're not even sure that you would go to heaven. I'm wondering, is there anybody in the room like that today? Let me see your hand if you're here. You're just not sure. Anybody else? Yeah? Okay. God doesn't want you in question about that. I'm quite confident on that point. A few of you have indicated that's how you're feeling right now. I know... Uh, many of you, some of you who raised your hands even, that you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, but maybe you've just kind of in your heart drifted, maybe you've backslidden, maybe you've moved away. It doesn't really um, phase this grace we're talking about right now because this grace that saves us is not based on your works. It's based on His loving kindness and His mercy. And just as those of you, I just saw you, you lifted your hands before the Lord. I just feel today that I'm just supposed to, you know, God wants to restore you. He just wants to restore you to your place. So it'd be good for us just to take a minute and pray. Yeah. If you're, if you're here and you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you either have never asked Jesus into your heart, or you have, but you feel like you've, you've kind of gotten out of the place of grace, and you want prayer today. You've somehow stepped out of your place. I want you just to come on forward. 
We're just going to take a couple of minutes. Just come on, don't be ashamed. You'll not regret getting this place right in your heart. Just do it. Just do it. It's, just, it's more about obedience than it's about anything else. Just come on. Don't be ashamed and don't be afraid. God is not ashamed of you. Every one of us has had our seasons of being floundering and struggling. Just come on and be, be bold. Be bold before the Lord. Amen. Yeah, that's a, that's a possibility as well. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Come on. If you're outside, you feel like you're outside the grace that God's appointed for your life and you've drifted off the path, or you've just, you just know in your heart you need to get something right, I'm just asking you, I'm just hanging for a second for you. Is there anybody else like that today? Thank you, Lord. Cheryl also mentioned, and I think it's true, <clears throat> some of you maybe know that you've never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know that you've not had that second encounter with God. If you have in your heart this knowing that there's something you, you've neglected or missed out, come on up here as well. We're going to pray together. But I want to I focus in right now on those that are standing here. Father, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for these that are here right now. God, how precious they are to you. And I thank you for their willingness to step out front publicly, Lord. I know it's a big deal for you. Jesus, you said if we would deny you before men, you would deny us before your, your Father. You said if we would confess you before men, that you would confess us before your Father. I thank you that as these have stepped out here today, unashamed and not uh, more concerned with what people would think than they are with what you would think. I thank you for that today. And God, you know exactly why each one is standing here, where they've been, what they're struggling with. And I just want to say thank you, Holy Spirit. Would you just lift your hands this morning? Just lift them up. It's okay. It's the sign of surrender. That's what we're here to do. So put them up. Go ahead. This... This is important that you just lift your hands before the Lord. It's an open heart that says, Jesus, here am I. I just want you to pray this with me. Now listen, this only matters based on what's going on in your heart. That's it. It's not a formula. It's a heart thing. Just say with me, say, Father. Come on, say it with your own mouth. Father. I come to you in Jesus' name. And I acknowledge my need for you. I'm asking today. I'm looking today for grace to help where I find myself right now. I ask you to forgive me for thinking that my way was better than yours. And I come back to you with my whole heart. I believe that your grace is better than my efforts. I believe that your way is better than my way. And I return to you. Wash me. Cleanse me. And put me back on the path. That's my prayer. I receive this grace. I ask you to help me today. To be a good steward of this grace. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.
stretch your hands out, congregation, toward those that are here. I just want to speak a blessing today. Lord, I thank you so much for these standing here. How important, how special, how precious they are to you. God, I thank you today. Not by might and not by power, but by your spirit, Jesus. God, I thank you for untangling in order to take for yourself, to catch up for yourself, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, a fresh release from the past into the future, the destiny, the purpose, the plan. Thank you for the plan, Lord. From the foundation of the world, the plan, your plan, your perfect plan, your grace-filled plan, your plan that knows no lack, it knows no torment. God, thank you now for making it so for my brother, for my sister. God, thank you for grace upon grace, grace upon grace. Grace upon grace, though you may create a problem to fix a problem, Father, I thank you for widening my sister's lens to see what you see and that her wrestlings, God, are not in vain. I thank you for giving her the desires of her heart as she releases, releases her request to fit your will beyond her own circumstance. In Jesus' name, thank you. God, thank you for the fragrance of heaven over my sister. Thank you, Father God, for stripping off the fatigue, the weariness of the flesh, the heaviness. God, I thank you for your promise, which is like an anchor that's gone in behind the veil, a hope that cannot be moved. And God, I thank you, though the wind and the waves have blown hard against her life, that you, Father God, have remained faithful even when she's felt faithless. And Lord, I thank you now for pulling her into your boat and letting her see what you see about her in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for my dear sister, and I pray today, Holy Spirit, God, I thank you for cleansing her conscience from dead works, that this idea of having to earn it having to be good enough, God. I strip that off, and I ask you, Holy Spirit, to visit my sister, that she'll know that she knows that she knows that it's by your grace that she's found such favor, not by her own doing. And may she enjoy it, Jesus. I pray in your beautiful name. Thank you, Father. Father, thank you for my brother. God, I thank you that you've come to crown him with loving kindness and tender mercies. God, I thank you that you've seen him coming. You've known his heart, Lord. And you've given, him, uh, you've given him slack in the rope to go find and to know that it is you and you alone, Lord God, who will satisfy and fulfill the deep longings of his heart. God, I pray for a baptism of fire in the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the fire of God coming on my brother. God, that he would be so... in enthralled with you, that he would be so captivated by you, Holy Spirit, that he couldn't sleep at times because he'd be so excited about what you're saying and what you're doing, that he couldn't be silent, Lord God, because of what you're saying and what you're doing. God, I thank you for radically changing him. And I just pull up every root, every root of condemnation and shame, everything that would be trying to hold him back. In Jesus' name, I break your power from off of my brother and release him into the peace and the joy of the Lord. I just hear the Lord saying, Logan, lift up your head, my brother. Lift up your head. God has not caused you to look down, but caused you to look up. That's where he sees you as a son. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for my dear sister. I just speak peace to her. <laughs> yep. Peace. Peace, peace, peace. Your warfare, says the Lord, has almost come to an end. But the warfare has been an internal one in your own soul. And the Lord says, daughter, know this. I've never lost sight of you, though at times you've lost sight of me. I've had my eye on you with tenderness and love in my heart. I'm not mad at you, says the Lord. I'm for you. 
And I'm come to claim you and catch you up to myself and to my purpose and my plan. My way and my yoke is easy. Your way is hard, says the Lord. Believe it. Walk in the light as I am in the light. And you'll have such benefit and blessing, says the Lord. Such provision. I'm pouring over you fresh grace and fresh hope for the future. And you'll know it's me and not the work of a man because I'm going to do it in a way that makes it clear it's my hand on you and my favor. And I bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah. Glory to God. Thank you. <clears throat> Father, over this congregation at large right now, I just want to say thank you for grace that we need to find, but you're so willing to help us find. I want to say thank you today for helping us each to discover our place of grace and our pace of grace. I thank you for blessing each one here today. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen and amen. Praise God. You're dismissed.